All right, let's do it. Come on in. Come on in. Come on, Mark. There you go. Good to see you. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. I always forget the hallelujah. Oh, you do it again. I'll do it right. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. There you go. Thank you. Hey, it's so good to see you. Easter's so powerful. We're not just going to celebrate it for a you know, an hour and then walk away. We're going to do Easter for about six weeks, maybe seven. That's I'm not right. sure, yeah. but whatever. And we're going to sing every Easter hymn we can possibly sing. And we're going to be affirmed that our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, just as he said he did. And more people saw him alive after the resurrection that will be in either of our services this morning. Think of that. Over 500 people saw him alive. And uh, man, I don't know what else you need, but how about a baptism? Should we do a baptism We have a today? baptism at every service this week. We have a baptism at every, every service? Every service this Sunday. 8.30, 10.30, Walker Hall 10.30, even Walker Hall 6.30. So that's, that's super cool. Even Walker Hall 6.30. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Super cool. Do we get uh, workman's comp claims for uh, working I don't know. with I, water? Or? I don't know about that. <laughs> but, yeah. So we, we do have a beautiful baptism today of Hazel Schluter. And the Schluters usually sit in the back. But this morning they get to sit in the front. And I believe, Tim, this is fifth or sixth generation Schluter baptized. Six. That's what I said this morning. That's so neat, you guys. And uh, what a blessing. What a blessing that is for, for us and for little, little Hazel today. Uh, Mike is preaching today. Do you want to give us a little foretaste of the feast to come? Sure. What are yeah. you preaching on? Um, I get to preach on Thomas today, and I very much look forward to talking about doubt, doubt. right? Mm -hmm. Doubt comes in, but also uh, the need for proof. So I look forward to talking about that today. That'll be yeah. good. Yeah. That'll be good. So we're, we're uh, welcoming uh, visitors and guests today. If you uh, came last week and you said, you know what, I think that's a good thing. I, I think you'll be pleased today too. We've got cathedral singers singing and the music and the service will be super nice and good for your heart and good, good for your soul. If you're interested in finding out more about St. John's or leaving us a, 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 a prayer request, those can be received on the cards in the pew rack before you. If you can put those in with the offering or just hand it to either Micah or I or one of the ushers, we'd be happy to pray for you or get you connected into the greater community of, of our church. With that, uh, we're going to ring the bell, and as we ring the bell, our service will begin, and, and we'll stand together, and uh, do we sing the opening hymn, or do we, I always screw that, oh yeah, church is one foundation. So as we do that, we'll stand together and sing the opening hymn.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.
seated. It's so good to be gathered together today in the community of the church. One of the largest pieces of um, struggle in our culture is isolation and loneliness. If you ask people and you say, well, what, what bugs you? What, what's going on? Why are, you, you know, why are things in your life the way they are? And they say, well, I don't know anybody and I don't have friends and I just kind of work here and do my computer and, you know, and... And so community becomes a powerful thing. Community of, of, of our friends and family, as, as with the shooters this morning, and the friends and family that we have in the body of Christ, the community of faith that unites us together, not just in what we do, but in our identity and who we are, and then to be able to do things corporately in community, to sing together, to worship together, to enjoy beautiful music together, to celebrate together. It's just super cool. Uh, and, and, and it adds a certain amount of value to what you do. And again, your identity, who, who you are. You belong to Christ. That's who we are and, and what we're all about. And it's kind of interesting that something as beautiful as, as a baptism draws us all in. If you're looking at your watch now saying, when are they going to be done? Usually people wait for the sermon for that. And they say, when is he going to be done? But we sit in this moment of baptism because in holy baptism, <laughs> he went to school with my daughter and coached these kids and loved on them. And sorry, I'm going to cry like a baby, but that's okay. But the community, right? Through baptism, little Hazel has community with God. She's attached to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And then she's also attached to the family of faith. And God makes both of those promises in Acts chapter 2. In Matthew 28, we get the, 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 the piece of this where the Lord Jesus says, this is what you do. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then Jesus said that part about community. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And so today through the washing and the water and the word of holy baptism, Hazel May Schluter uh, becomes a part of the community of faith. And uh, we celebrate that and rejoice with your crew, your crew today. Um, work. <laughs> kids are work, right? It's just crazy how much work it is and all of those things. And, and now you've got a house full and doing your thing. And, and so I ask you to do a little bit, a little bit more, but you've got your godparents here with you and a whole host of people who love you to walk with you. So I ask you, will you raise Hazel in the faith? When she's of age, we put the scriptures into her hands. We remind her of the promises God made for her in her baptism. And uh, we see that she learns the essential parts of the Christian faith. Pieces like the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and that remaining and living in that baptismal hope and promise, she would lead a godly life to the praise and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll do that, please answer by saying, we will with the help of God. Good. God be with you, bless you in these acts of love and encouragement. And your clan... The, uh, the clan of, of, of your dear family, will you continue to reach out in love to Tim and, and Danielle and, and their children? Will you support them in what they do and who they are and pray for them and encourage them in your family's walk of faith together? If so, please answer together by saying, we will with the help of God. Good. God bless you and keep you in those marvelous acts of love and family. Um, Will you have your daughter be baptized into the Christian faith in the name of God the Father who created her, his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who redeemed her, and the Holy Spirit who calls her to faith? If so, please answer, we will. Good. I get to hold her? Oh, man, Tim. <laughs> gotcha, sunshine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> sunshine. I told my wife this morning, I said, I get to hold little Hazel today. <laughs> oh, look at 
look at you, stretch. Yeah, stretch, Hazel. Hazel, may Schluter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's begotten you again of water and the Spirit, and who has forgiven you all your sins, keep you in this faith to life everlasting. The peace of the Lord Jesus is with you always. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, you're precious, honey. Yeah. You're just perfect. Oh. Here you go. I don't know, Danielle. I might just hold her for a while here. This is. <laughs> we can trust Sonny with this? Yeah. Yeah, kind of sketchy on that, too. This is Hazel. She's the newest member of St. John's Lutheran Church, but even more, she's the newest member in the body of Christ. We did a funeral on Saturday for a gentleman who was 99, actually 100. And I did that kind of knowing that we had one who is held as Hazel six weeks, eight weeks? Two months today. Two, mo two months today. Knew that God was renewing and refilling the body of Christ and that we were going to be able to celebrate new life the Sunday after Easter. So I invite you to put your hands together and welcome Hazel May Schluter into the family of faith. And you guys, she's just, she's just beautiful. Who's holding on to her dada? You got her, Tim? So smaller than a football or basketball, but still. All right. Now, I think the Schluters, when they came to America, traded the umlaut for an E, Schluter, yeah. And so the German in the windows, I'm sure Hazel can already read the German already because, you know, it's part of her heritage. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the, the one on the right with the candle, there, there, there's no way Jesus had a candle like that, I don't think. But this says, uh, Ich bin das Licht der Welt, I'm the light of the world. And the service started this morning with those promises of the Lord being a light for all of us, but particularly this morning for Hazel, a light that provides purity and grace, a light that provides direction for her and her life, and a life that leads her home to heaven. And so God be with you and bless you. Sonny will be able to buy an enormously expensive breakfast a year from today and every year going forward as, uh, as you light the candle and tell the story and remember God's goodness to your family. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, it's so good to be together today. I thank you that you have renewed this beautiful family. I thank you for Tim and Danelle and for their life together. And pray your hand of blessing upon their home. I, I pray that it's joyful and peaceful and full of grace and love and, and activity. And pray your hand of blessing upon the family that's with them this morning, that they would lock arms and continue to walk together as a group of people who know you and love you. We pray your hand of blessing and favor also to be upon St. John's. And thank you for an opportunity to be in a community that cares so deeply for children and families and commits the, our, our hearts, our resources, our lives to seeing that children are raised in the faith. So be with us, Lord, and guide us as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Danielle's got that. Sonny's got that. Okay, here we go. So excited this morning. She's just beautiful. And your family is, oh, are you kidding me? I'm so excited. If you need me to hold her during the sermon, I'm in too. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Congratulations. Our first reading this morning is recorded in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
and, Scott, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, which is recorded in the 20th chapter of John. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After, this, he, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need proof. That's the main statement from our main man, Thomas, today. You also may have said the same thing in your life. Maybe you're saying that same thing today. And I don't think it's an accident that the story of Thomas follows the Easter Gospel reading from last week. We have the miraculous and glorious resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But there's one who isn't so sure. Thomas needs proof. And his story is recorded for our benefit in the scriptures. For if Christ had not been risen from the dead, our faith would be in vain. I've always loved the story of Thomas. When I saw my name on the preaching schedule for April 7th and saw John 20, I was like, yes, I get to preach on Thomas. This is great. And some of you know my background. I studied chemistry and biology in college in a previous life before studying theology. And I have always thought of Thomas as the biblical scientist. He puts the scientific method into action. The scientific method, it starts with observations. It starts with questions. And once the observations have been made, then you form a hypothesis. You test the hypothesis. Then you analyze what you found and you report your conclusions. And then you try to repeat the process. Thomas, he's heard multiple observations of his fellow disciples and his friends. Mary Magdalene, she saw the risen Lord. And not only that, she held on to him. You heard that last week. Peter and John, they've seen the empty tomb. Peter has seen the cloth, the linen still lying in its place, separate from the linen. The two Emmaus disciples, recorded in Luke's gospel, they felt their hearts burn on the road with him. When Jesus talked with them on the road and he opened the scriptures to them, they recognized Jesus when he broke the bread. And in our gospel reading today, the entire company of disciples had seen the risen Lord. And that conclusion of all the friends around Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas has his own observations, and he has a little bit of recency bias. Thomas knows what he saw with his eyes on Good Friday. There's no way the body of Jesus is alive. He saw how his friend was mocked. He saw how his teacher suffered. He saw how his Lord was crucified. He saw how his master had a spear pierce his side. There's no coming back from that. Jesus' body, it must be cold, must be dead, must be lifeless, must be still, lying in a guarded tomb with a stone rolled in front of it. So Thomas responds to his friend's observations, a Scroogean bah humbug. And this response is a little shocking. These are not just Thomas' friends. These are his closest friends. These are people that Thomas has lived with for the past three years in community, people he knows that are credible, people he knows have reputations that he can trust, that Thomas himself can validate. Thomas not only doubts, he challenges everything that is said to him. And we have something now more serious and nefarious than doubt. We have unbelief. We know Thomas is not there when Jesus first appeared. Where was he? Did Thomas have the most ill-timed bathroom break in Scripture? <laughs> was he the brave runner for food and supplies? Or was he actually with the other disciples in that locked room? Did he isolate himself? Scripture is silent on the exact reasoning for Thomas' absence, but it's likely the latter, that he isolated himself. Thomas should by no means have been absent. They were a group. They were together. And R.C.H. Lenski writes that one of the twelve that you heard in verse 24 is hint enough why Thomas was absent. That little descriptive statement, one of the twelve, that's how the Synoptic Gospels refer to Judas. There is no doubt Thomas is hurt. Thomas is doubting, no pun intended. 
Thomas was stubborn in his unbelief, but it's also not hard to see that Thomas felt betrayed. Why I love Thomas is that he's so relatable. You can see the different colors of emotions upon the canvas of Thomas in today's gospel. Anger and sadness, grief and doubt, loneliness, abandonment, disbelief, stunned, betrayal. Emotions that we can sympathize with. A cancer diagnosis, the sudden loss of a loved one, job loss, war in the world, violence in the news, political bickering. These are just a few of the things that our world sees that can make us stubborn in our own belief. Maybe you know some other things too that people around you are stubborn in their own disbelief. Thomas is an easy person to see yourself in. And we know Thomas isn't afraid to ask questions. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to go prepare a place for them and that his disciples knew the way to the place where he was going. And it's Thomas who says, Lord, I don't know where you're going. Not just I, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus gives Thomas an answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And though we see Thomas in his doubt, in his stubborn state today, it doesn't appear like he was always like that. In John chapter 11, Jesus went to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead, the brother of Martha and Mary. And it's the chapter where Jesus declares he is the resurrection and the life. But going to Bethany is not without danger. The disciples, they try to remind Jesus, Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, yet you are going back? Jesus pressed on, and then it is Thomas, John chapter 11, verse 16, who says, Let us also go, that we may die with him. This Thomas is a complicated character. Don't just take John 20 for his doubt. Take the whole picture. So Thomas, in his doubt, he needs to test the hypothesis and conclusion that Christ had indeed risen from the dead for himself. Maybe you've heard it said, I won't believe it until I see it. But even that question is incomplete for Thomas. The simple observation of sight was not going to do it for Thomas. He needed to fulfill his sense of touch. Thomas needed proof. He needed visual proof. More than that, he needed gory proof. He needed two senses fulfilled, sight and touch, and he needed two places on Christ's body to fulfill his need for belief. He not only needed to see nail marks, he needed to put his finger into his hands. He needed to put his full hand into the side of Jesus. Interestingly, Thomas needed double the evidence of what the other disciples needed. Thomas knows what he saw. And with every incoming report of the resurrection of Jesus, it was like adding salt to his wounds. You can feel Thomas in his troubled heart, digging in his heels of doubt. Christ indeed had not risen from the dead. I saw it. I know it. I believe it. And making matters worse for Thomas is the amount of time that he has to sit, that he has to ponder. Jesus appears on Easter evening to his disciples. Thomas isn't there. And he won't appear until a week later. So what debates did Thomas and the other disciples get into? Thomas must have really been driven nuts by the other disciples. Christ really is risen, Thomas. What doesn't get discussed much is Thomas's isolation. Thomas and the other disciples are behind locked doors for fear of the Jewish leaders. They are fearing persecution. Not only have they lost their leader and their Lord, they're trying not to lose their lives. And not only was Thomas isolated in physical location, he was isolated in his own ideology. He was the lone holdout that Christ had not risen from the dead. And all this makes for a complex situation, a complex formula for Thomas in the locked house. Thomas is not wrong for asking questions. Jesus encourages us to ask. Remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. 
But Thomas is wrong for asking questions with biases. Not only a violation of the scientific method, but also a violation of the Christian life. His mind, Thomas, is made up with an ice cold heart of bias and prejudice, towards doubt, towards defiance, not with a moldable and shapeable heart towards curiosity and wonder. When Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to little children, to infants, just as we saw was baptized today, we remember what we have been taught. We do remember how we've been educated, but we continue to live with a heart of curiosity and wonder. We may not have a bias and prejudice in scientific experiments, but we do have our biases in social situations. We cast off the weak instead of raising them up. We stereotype others instead of valuing others. We speak before we listen. We must check ourselves of our biases, our biases against the children and people that God has made around us, biases against the miraculous power of God to heal and reconcile, biases against the miraculous power of God to resurrect. And Thomas, Thomas is healed of those biases. As you heard, he needed to feel the warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the grain of wood, the heft of stone, the last frail twitch of flesh and bone. And what Thomas needed, Jesus meets him. Jesus meets Thomas not with a word of stern rebuke or anger. No, he meets Thomas with a word of peace. Peace be with you. A word of forgiveness, a tone of comfort, a tone of reassurance. Jesus speaks to Thomas as though he himself had heard every single word that Thomas demanded. And in this story, you can place yourself in the room. You can see the scales of doubt and unbelief falling from Thomas's heart, Thomas's mind, Thomas's eyes. You can see Thomas fall to his knees proclaiming, my Lord and my God. And you can hear Jesus blessing you today with the final beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. So are you waiting for Jesus to meet you? Maybe you are Thomas. Maybe you're talking with a Thomas. Whether you have been attending your church your whole entire life, or whether this is your first time here today, or this is your second time, Easter was so intriguing that you needed to come back for more. The devil loves to seep doubt into the cracks of your life and also into the cracks of your confidence in Christ. And when doubt seeps in, be careful about setting demands on your own terms. By faith, meet God on his terms. Can you replicate the scientific method of meeting the resurrected Lord for yourself? And the answer to that in this earthly world is sort of. We do meet the resurrected Lord. We meet him in his body and blood here in the altar. We meet him in water, where he places water upon our foreheads and gives us the forgiveness of sins. But maybe the full replication of the resurrection of Jesus is later, and the only thing that separates us from doing so is time. Time, that long period which can cause forgetfulness, which can cause recency bias, which can cause us to look at the things most closest to us and not looking at the things beyond, the things unseen. Can you replicate the scientific method of the resurrection? I encourage you to test the hypothesis and the conclusion of the resurrection for yourself in God's word. Read it for yourself. Ask questions to go deeper. Just like Thomas, you need to hear that message of Jesus' love consistently and frequently for when you are in doubt. Let Jesus meet you in his gospel. Let him meet you right here in his sacraments. Touch and taste of his body and blood. And if you have not been baptized, see water and the word over your forehead for the forgiveness of your sins. Keep coming to hear the word. Keep asking questions with a heart of faith, of curiosity, of wonder. Dig your heels into the firm foundation that it is Christ alone. You may not be able to test that hypothesis of the resurrection by putting your hand into Jesus' side, but you do taste of the bodily resurrection today in his body and blood. 
You hear the good news. You see the fruits of faith in your brothers and sisters around you. You touch others locked behind doors with the gospel message of hope through letters you write, through calls that you make, through the prayers that you offer for one another. Through the hearing of the gospel and the working of the Holy Spirit, you look forward to when that resurrection will be concluded by all. When every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The dead will rise first. We who are alive will be caught up together with them in the, in the air to meet the Lord. And when the resurrection of the body will be a foregone conclusion in that last day, all will say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. At the graveside services that we offer at St. John's for the members and brothers and sisters in our church, we read Job 19 almost every single graveside. And Job 19 reads like this. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. You will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. On that final day, when you close your eyes here on earth, or when Jesus comes back again, you won't test the hypothesis of the resurrected Lord. You're going to confirm it with what you've known all along by the gift of faith. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. Having heard the words of life, let's stand together and confess the Christian faith. This morning we confess the faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on the screen before you are printed in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have given to all who believe exceedingly great and precious promises. Grant to us your Holy Spirit that we may without all doubt trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, so that our faith in your sight may never be found wanting. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord our God, bless your church throughout the world and draw the scattered flock of Christ into a visible unity, making your church a sign of hope to our divided world. Heal divisions among us. Make us one in heart and mind. Remove timidity from our tongues. Strengthen us to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. Powerfully make your grace work among us for the benefit of others. Lord, in your mercy, here. 
Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. You are the firstborn over all creation and the firstborn from the dead. May the gift of your word, which tells us what the holy prophets and apostles heard, saw, looked out, and touched, have free course in your world as a testimony to all nations, and be preached to the joy and instruction of your holy people, that they may believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing have life in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we rejoice this morning with Steve and Linda Sunvold as they celebrate their 56th anniversary. We rejoice at the longevity and the joy of their marriage, and we ask that you would continue to bless all those who are linked into the bond of marriage, and pray that you would bless homes and families with your peace and with your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that uh, you have uh, allowed us to witness and participate in this morning in the baptism of Hazel May Schluter, daughter of Tim and Danelle Schluter, granddaughter of Glenn and Raina Schluter, and great-granddaughter of John and Jackie Schluter. We thank you for her whole family that's here with her today, and we ask your hand a blessing upon her as she continues to grow and, and uh, as, as life just unrolls for Tim and Danielle as well. Bless their home with your marvelous peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Amelia Rose Manuet, for Willa Daisy Clayton, for Barry Joseph McGinnis and his son, Douglas Patrick McGinnis, all of those who will be received into the community of the faithful through the washing of the water and word of holy baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in your ministry, you reached out and, and touched so many people. Lord, even your word brought healing and a presence of peace to those who had afflictions. This morning, we have an extensive list of people with great needs before you, all members of our community, mothers and fathers, fathers and sons, family and friends. So this morning, we pray for those who are struggling with cancer. We pray for Brianna Ottaway, Sarah Osmond, Rudy Barba, Kirsten Berry, Olivia Beal, Patrick Burke, Titsok Sabalos, Jim Covington, Scarlett Cruz, Dorothy Dale, Mikey Enriquez, Mike Farina, Gail Forbes, Judy Facuda, Annie Bates Gansky, Jesus Gonzalez, Jim Hetherington, Carol Holmes, Von Holt, Carolyn Miller, Todd Peterson, Brandon Reynolds, Rona Ross, Gina Santanello, Bob Schluter, Megan Small, Dave Tibbs, Steve Tyler, Denise Wyrick. We pray for Howard and Louise Worthington, for George Zahn and Heather Zelenka. We also pray for those who are uh, recovering from or anticipating surgery and ask your healing hand upon them. We remember all those, Lord, not listed this morning in our prayers, but those who we remember in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort those who grieve, as Vicar Micah preached this morning, that they may hold on to the faith that their Redeemer lives, and that in the end they will stand and see Him face to face. Grant us comfort who have lost loved ones, and grant us your grace and your hope for a blessed reunion in heaven forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, it is your gracious will that your children live in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of those who would stir up violence and strife. Destroy the weapons of those who delight in war and violence and end all conflicts in the world. Give wisdom to those who govern. Protect those who serve in our military and those who serve in our community, bringing peace and protection and defend us from all evil. For into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd invite you to turn around and shake a hand and welcome your brothers and sisters to the peace of Christ.
we stand together as we celebrate the sacrament. Please join me as we pray together. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in your name and as you have taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said to them, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let's stand together. And now may this same body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace and in the joy of the Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.